بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين So firstly, uh, just to let everyone know who is here, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, I'm going to say some intentions. It's always best for us to start off with intentions uh, so we can be reminded of Allah and why it is that we do what we do and um, to stay in a constant state of remembrance first. So we'll say those intentions in Arabic first, inshallah, uh, and then we'll translate them afterwards, okay? So just please bear patience. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا أنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شدت سهلا سهلا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صبري ويسر لي أمري وحل العبدة من لسان يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يقربنا إليك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين يا فتاح يا عليم افتح لنا فتحا قريبا يا فتاح يا عليم افتح لنا فتحا قريبا يا فتاح يا عليم افتح لنا فتحا قريبا اللهم اغننا بالعلم وزينا بالحلم واكرمنا بالتقوى وجملنا بالعافية يا أرحم الراحمين نويت التعلم والتعليم والتذكر والتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة وحذ على التمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله والدلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى First we start off by praising Allah the Most High and we send praises and benedictions unto his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his righteous and noble family and his beloved companions. Peace be upon them all. O oh Allah, nothing is easy except that which you make easy and you are the ever living, the self-subsisting, self-subsisting. You make that which is difficult and distressing easy if you choose to do so. All glory be to you, O Allah, with no faults attributed to you. There is no knowledge with us except that which you have given us and that which you have taught us. Truly, you are the all-knowing, the all-wise. O nurturer, expand our chests tonight and make our affairs easy. And please untie the knots from our tongues and please strengthen our speech so that we will understand one another. O Allah, teach us that which will benefit us and benefit us by that which you've taught us and increase us in knowledge and actions that will draw us closer to you, O Allah. By your mercy, O most merciful of those who show mercy. O opener, O all-knowing, grant us a speedy opening. O opener, O all-knowing, grant us a speedy opening. O opener, O all-knowing, grant us a speedy opening. O Allah, enrich us with knowledge and adorn us with wisdom and honor us with consciousness of you and beautify us with piety. O Allah, we intend to learn and to teach and to be reminded and to remind and to be benefited and to benefit and to be of use and to take advantage advantage of this opportunity by your mercy, O most merciful of all those who are merciful. All of that by holding and grasping onto the book of Allah, the Quran, the glorious Quran, and the living ways, the sunan, the tr traditions of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all while pointing others and ourselves towards goodness and seeking and desiring the countenance of Allah, his pleasure, his nearness, his reward for truly he is without flaw and he is the most high. Alhamdulillah. So tonight, thank you guys all for coming out. We have a, a very beautiful program today that we will hopefully be able to benefit from. And it's about the beautiful story of Musa alayhi salam. And this is a very young Musa alayhi salam and his teacher al-Khidr. And uh, just out of respect, even though in the tafsir and the explanations that are given, by the scholars inside of the uh, Quran who explains that Al-Khidr is who Allah is talking about. We're just going to relate to him as Moses' teacher, inshallah. 
because Allah doesn't directly mention his name in the Quran, but just for those who may be online as well, uh, maybe don't know this name Al-Khidr, inshallah. And so to give ourselves some context on what this story is about and what is going on, uh, there came a point in time in Musa's young adulthood, and he has, uh, uh, he's a prophet at this point in time of his life. And he was given a khutbah. He was given a sermon. Imagine a young man who's given a sermon to his people. And so a brother out of the crowd comes up to young Musa. And he asks him a question. And he asks, Musa, are you the most knowledgeable of, of people? And naturally, what would a prophet do? He replied, yes, right? But Musa faltered in this answer because he should have said, Allahu A'lam, Allah is the most knowing, right? And again, this is a young Musa, and all of us can relate to Musa, no matter what our age is. Sometimes we falter and we maybe have a, what's called a slip of the tongue, and we may say something that is wrong, and we don't realize what we've said. And so... Allah being as loving as he is for his creation, for you and I, and he shows us in the Quran with his prophet Musa alayhi salam, he commands Musa to go on a journey, to learn something that he doesn't know because he isn't the most knowledgeable, even though he is a prophet of Allah, right? There are certain characteristics and quality traits that Allah, the most high, gives to his creation. And he has spread out his bounty whether it be people with intellect or good looks or whatever the case is, a certain type of obedience, that's what Allah has dispelled out to his creation. And he's made some people better than others in some of it and, and not. Right. And we all have our portion from Allah, the most high. And so with what he has given us within the, the breadth of that, we must apply ourselves as best as we can to our utmost best of what we can. And Allah will, will reward us so forth and, and so on, right? But that's to our threshold, not to the threshold of anybody else, correct? Because some of us are more challenged in certain areas than others. And so what we want to do while diving into the story of Musa alayhi salam is we want to be able to really connect ourselves, inshallah, and to be able to see ourselves in Musa because we share uh, similar things that happens inside of our life with Musa at this point in time. And we also want to look at this teacher as well, Al-Khidr, because there are times in our lives as well, whether we are fathers, whether we are children, uh, whether we are some type of leader inside of a community or someone that others have access to, and we play a significant role in other people's lives, where we are teaching at some point in time. And so we must also look at the teacher and his response and his patience of what he had with this young Musa. This young Musa is doing really good work and he's attempting to do his best. But sometimes we may claim and we may, uh, as they say, uh, take to, uh, eat off too much on a plate, right? Like the plate is too big. We, we took on more than what we can actually do. And so sometimes or they also say, uh, like, you put your foot in your own mouth, right? You bit off more than you can chew. And so Musa kind of experiences this on his journey with his teacher. So uh, again, to finish our context, before we get into the Quran and listen to the glorious words of our Lord, Allah, Azza wa Jal. So Musa had been given this question and he says, you know, he's the most knowing. And so the Allah commands Musa to go on a journey and where these two seas meet. And on that journey, Allah tells Musa that he will end up fighting a man who is more knowledgeable than him. And Musa, along this journey, he was commanded also to take a companion with him, another young man, and to take this fish. And so they took a fish with them, and then this fish ended up leaping out inside of an amazing way um, from Musa uh, when they got tired. Because Musa was at the point in time where they wanted to consume their meal because they had been exhausted on their travel. And so the young boy who accompanied Musa on this trip when Musa told him, come and make our breakfast, the young man, he was like, oh, I forgot to tell you that something really amazing actually happened last night, but only the shaitan could have made me forget it. And Allah is explaining this inside of the Quran. And so Musa said, ah, that's it. 
we must retrace our steps and go back to where the fish had escaped. And that's where I'll find this teacher and that I can learn something good from. Inshallah. So now to begin, we'll start with the Quran. فَوَجَدَا عَبْدًا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا آتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّ عِلْمًا So Allah says in His glorious Qur'an, these two young men and the one who, are we, who we're really focusing on is Musa alayhi salam. They ended up coming to the point where they found this teacher. May Allah have peace on him. And Allah describes this man as that he gave him a special type of mercy. A mercy which some of the scholars say that he was granted the ability to see into the future. Al-Khidr. And so with this ability from if we apply what the scholars have said, even though this isn't directly mentioned inside of the Quran, Allah describes it as a rahmah. Allah also continues and he says that he gave that teacher a special type of knowledge. Right, and that knowledge may also point to this uh, knowing how Musa is going to react and how he's going to be on this journey, and that he knows more of something else of a different type of knowledge that Musa isn't privy to. <laughs> So this young Musa. He comes to Al-Khidr, the teacher, very excited as our youth are, right? When someone is young and inspired, they're eager to want to learn something. Whether it be a certain type of sport or a certain type of art, the young people, anyone who's interested in something, has this burning desire to learn something. So you can imagine this young Musa, he goes to his teacher and he says, can I please follow you? Can I come with you so that I can learn of the goodness and the righteousness that you've been taught? So then his teacher replies, قَالَ إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَقِيعَ مَعِيَ صَبَرَةً وَكَيْفَ تَصْبِرُ عَلَى مَا لَمْ تُحِطَ بِهِ خُبَرَةً And so his teacher replies, he says, Musa, truly you will never have patience with me. And how is it, Musa? How is it, young person, that you will have patience with something which your mind can't comprehend? Right? We find ourselves in life at times. We find ourselves struggling. We may be eager to learn something. And so we may hastily go about it, but we just don't have a certain type of understanding. And one thing I can point to is that, for example, growing up playing sports, Right. You may see a kid, they might watch some uh, highlights of a Stephen Curry or something. Right. And so now people are really getting upset that the game of basketball is changing because when the young kids who are inspired by this athlete, now they want to just get the ball and go start chucking up threes and they don't even learn the fundamentals. Right. So their mind doesn't comprehend or grasp the game, essentially the fundamentals. Right. They haven't learned how to dribble. They don't know the rules. They don't know what is going out of bounds, an example, etc. I hope that was an analogy that everyone here could kind of uh, connect with. But it's the simple things. It's like even mathematics. Right. Like if a kid wanted to study mathematics and they understand that two plus two equals four. And now they want to do multiplication or some in-depth type of algebra. Right. They don't have the basics, what it takes. Their mind hasn't grasped the concept yet. So therefore, they're going to naturally make mistakes. But yet their eagerness is still very important. It's good that the youth and that people who are interested in something has this ambition. But we have to also have patience in whatever it is that we want. And just before we get back to the uh, surahs, we also we notice this with all of the beloved prophets of Allah. Right. There are many different prophets who suffered. And they spent years under whatever scrutiny that Allah Azza wa Jal had put them through. And Allah shows us and he reveals these signs to us to know, oh human being, slow down. Take your time and what it is that you are intending to learn. Today we live in such a fast paced society, right? We get Amazon shipping, uh, whatever it is that we order in one day, right? We can speed it up as much as we want to. 
Whenever we want the best tasting type of food, we just go ahead and order it and it's to our door. So we're getting with, with more and more of this uh, ease that comes. We become more disconnected to the reality of what time is and how much it actually takes to develop within a certain type of science or anything it is that you want to study. So continuing the story, after the teacher tells Musa that you will never have patience with me, and how could you have patience over something that you can't even wrap your mind around? Musa replies, قَالَ سَتَجِدُنِي إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ صَابِرًا وَلَا أَعُصِي لَكَ أَمْرًا So this young Musa, eager still, he says, you know what? By the will of Allah, inshallah, God willingly, you will not find me impatient. Okay? Now remember, we talked about putting your foot inside of your mouth earlier, correct? So Musa, he responds and he tells him, you won't find me impatient. I promise. And I won't go against anything it is that you tell or teach me. So after this response, the teacher, Al-Khidr, he says, فَإِنِ اتَّبَعْتَنِي فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِي عَنْ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى أُحْدِثَ لَكَ مِنْهُ ذِكْرًا So the teacher, Al-Khidr, he responds to the young man. And he tells the young Musa, he says, Okay, Musa, young person who is eager, he says to him, You are the one who said, that you won't go against anything that I do, right? Or I say, you won't go against my command. So if you, if I allow you to follow me, then these are the rules. Don't ask me about anything that I do, young man or young woman for a woman's case, until I have made mention of it, right? This is extremely important. One thing just to, uh, if anyone can, I, I think we can be interactive with this lesson today. Uh, and so, because uh, I also see some of us, I don't want to just be talking the whole time because it's a really, really great story. But um, sometimes I will go out into the crowd and please participate and say some things and add some things if you guys can. So you're just not hearing me talk away because I want, we should all be able to really ponder and think deeply about these meetings. And so this is an interactive session, inshallah. Forgive me for not mentioning that inside the beginning. And so, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. I was forgetting the point that I was going to make. One second. Yes. So the teacher uh, was reminding Musa alayhi salam that, uh, you know, don't ask me about anything until uh, I make mention of it. Right. Don't go against anything that I say. So then I will allow you to accompany me so you can learn something of that which you don't know. Now, can anybody in here share with us maybe some things like when we sign, whether it be a contract or we take on any responsibility in life, yet we maybe not fully we fully don't uh, uphold it. I, I feel like I can give a few examples, but I'd like to hear from the crowd if someone would like to share first, inshallah. The question is, do we know, of, and, and this isn't about exposing ourselves or telling any type of sin or anything like that. What I'm saying is, uh, it can be the mundane things that we may go through in life, right? We may sign up for something. We say that we're going to do something, yet we don't fully commit to it 100%. Is there anything that maybe the youth, anyone can share? Yes, brother. Uh, you know you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I want to just take the job or I'm gonna do the research. Well, I'm gonna do it to survive. Yeah. You don't have 15 years of experience doing it. Right, exactly. So that's a beautiful uh answer, right? And an insight. Sometimes we might not be as fully qualified. Maybe we might go to a job and it says, Okay, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, and you must be able to do this. Uh and you know, you still apply and say, and you tell them, yes, I can do all of these things. Yet you probably don't have 100 percent of those things. Right. Or maybe, for example, something as easy as like taking a break, uh, maybe taking more minutes on your break. You say you got a 15 minute break at work, yet you cheat the system. Right. And you go 20, 25 minutes because oh, they don't see me or whatever the case. So I've been working this job for however long. Right. Sometimes. Uh, we become flawed or we take on more than what we can actually commit to. 
and right and these are where sometimes the wrongdoings fall through the gaps and naturally we're human beings so we're going to make mistakes and we're going to uh, be flawed right so we're not talking about anybody being perfect but we just want to realize where our imperfections are so we can inshallah fill in those gaps and so we're going to see that with Musa inshallah as we continue so Allah continues in his glorious Quran and he says One second. Uh. Okay. فَانْطَلَقَ حَتَّى إِذَا رَكِبَ فِي السَّفِينَةِ خَرَقَهَا قَالَ أَخَرَقْتَهَا لِتُغْرِقَ أَهْلَهَا لَقَدْ جِدْتَ شَيْئًا إِمْرًا And so... As Musa gets the accreditation to go along with his teacher, Dhul Khidr, they go and they start on their journey together. And so as Musa takes on this new job of being a student, right, remember he is not supposed to go against anything that the teacher says or does for that matter. And so Al Khidr, he ends up taking an axe of what is mentioned inside of the tafsir, which is the exegesis, uh, exegesis of the Quran, like uh, the study of the Quran. And the teachers say that he took an axe and he uh, hit the boat to a degree to where not water didn't get inside of the boat of these poor people, but he caused it enough damage to where it was temporarily unserviceable. And so with Musa noticing this and being a prophet and an upright person, he says, man, what you do? You just put a hole inside of the boat to stop people from doing the good work that they've been doing. Like you've done something extremely evil. There was no point of you doing that. قال ألم أقول إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا. Oh Musa, didn't I tell you that you wouldn't be able to have patience with me? Is what Al Khidr replied. So look. Musa, he gets a chance. His teacher is patient enough, even though he was accused of something wrong, rightfully so in a sense, from Musa's perspective. He's accused of something, but yet he's still patient with Musa. And he just reminds him, right? Just like we're supposed to do as parents or as anyone who's shepherding anything in life. You gently remind that person who maybe went wrong or strayed off in some way and bring them back so they can get on track. And so that's how Al-Khidr was. So Musa replies when he's reminded about not saying anything. He says, Allah says, قَالَ لَا تُؤَاخِذْنِي بِمَا نَسِيتُ وَلَا تُرْهِقَنِي مِنْ أَمْرِ عُسْرًا So Musa as we like to say in our times, Musa said, please, stall me out, man. I, I, I totally messed up. I forgot. You know what you did say? I did promise you that I wouldn't uh, go against your command. I wouldn't say anything against what you have done. So please forgive me for that. Please don't make this difficult on me. I'm already in enough trouble, right? So please forgive me for going against what I said and I promise that I do. So Allah continues the story. فانطلق حتى إذا لقي غلاما فقتله قال أقتلت نفسا زكية بغير نفس لقد جدت شيئا نكرا So as they continue on their journey once again Musa and his teacher they come along and they see a young boy does anybody know what this teacher ended up doing to this young boy? Would anybody like to share? <laughs> exactly. He took the young boy's life. He killed him. And so naturally when Musa sees this, he exclaims and he says, Yo, what have you done? You just took the life of a young, innocent person who did no wrong. You took his life, an innocent soul who committed no wrong. This was absolutely terrible of you. What are you doing? So what did the teacher do? Can anybody let me know maybe how the teacher probably responded? Yes, young man. Uh, 
MashaAllah, exactly. So the teacher, he replies, thank you so much for sharing that. The teacher replies, and he actually emphasizes more so on this fact, because now this is Musa's second time where he goes against his command, right? So the teacher replies, قَالَ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكَ إِنَّكَ لَنْ تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِيَ صَبَرًا So the teacher replies to Musa once more, didn't I swear to you, Musa? Didn't I tell you, young man, that you surely would not have patience with me on this journey? So Musa replies, Allah says, so Musa says to his teacher, he says, man, I messed up again. And he says, how about this? Since I keep going against what you say, since I keep going against what you say, how about you have every single right to disown me as a student? If I say one more thing about anything it is that you do, I did say that I wouldn't go against anything that you said, my dear teacher. And I said I wouldn't I, I, I wouldn't even say any, a word nor go against any action that you did. Yep, I keep faltering. So you have every single right to let me go as your student and I will no longer follow you if I say one more thing. You have truly attained an excuse from me. This is my excuse. I have no more excuses. فَانْطَلَقَ حَتَّى إِذَا أَتَيَا أَحْلَ قَرْيَةٍ اسْتَطْعَمَا أَحْلَهَا فَأَبَوْا أَنْ يُضَيِّفُوهُمَا فَوَجَدَا فِيهَا جِدَارًا يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَنْقَضَّ فَأَقَامَهُ قَالَ لَوْ شِتَّا لَتَّخَذْتَا عَلَيْهِ أَجَرًا So for the third time, Musa and his teacher, may Allah be pleased with them both, continued on their journey. And so you can imagine, if anyone's ever traveled to the Arab lands, I had the ability to go to Egypt. And within traveling in the Arab lands, whatever color it is that you're uh, wearing, you're going to get dusty naturally because of the winds blowing and what the wind is carrying. And you're going to have tiredness, naturally. And so Musa and his teacher, they come to a group. They come to a small little village, right? And these people inside of this village were very inhospitable to Musa. Typically, the custom, and especially, and especially back in those days, when there were strangers who came into a town, specifically a village, this is a small place, people are very hospitable. They cook these guests some food, they get them water, they get them a place to stay and to sleep at. But these people were completely inhospitable to Musa and to his teacher. So within this time, even though these people were being very mean and stingy to Musa and his teacher, what did his teacher decide to do? Yes. Exactly. MashaAllah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. So the teacher, he ends up, uh, there was a wall that wanted to fall down. And so the teacher, being as a good servant of Allah as he is, no matter how creation is treating him, he sees that there's a uh, defect inside of the wall, inside of these people's village, and he takes it upon himself to do the right thing, no matter how they were treating him. And he fixed the wall, and he repatched it up. But guess what Musa said? And we're going to need a different person this time. Does anybody know what did Musa do this time? Did he falter again? Did he say anything else to his teacher? Okay, so we got the head now. <laughs> Does anybody know what he said? Go ahead. MashaAllah, man, you really following the story. Alhamdulillah. So yes, well, what Musa, and that is a part of it, definitely. But Musa said, he said, like, you could have at least taken a payment for it, right? Like, why would you be so kind to these people? They didn't give us a sandwich, no water. Nothing. No, not even a glass of milk. We've been tired, man. We've been traveling all this time. Like, you know, you killed the, you broke the bow. You killed the young man. We've been traveling. We come to this place to get some rest. 
and these people are inhospitable to us, and you are going to fix the wall for them? So what did the teacher end up doing? قَالَ هَذَا فِرَاقُ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنِكَ سَأُنَبِّئُكَ بِتَأْوِيلِ مَا لَمْ تَسْتَتِعْ عَلَيْهِ صَبَرًا So Al-Khidr, the teacher of Musa, he keeps his word because right, he's experienced like a father in some ways or like a scholar, right? He replies to Musa alayhi salam, may Allah be pleased with them both. He says, look Musa, young man, young person, young, young woman, this is where you and I will go our separate ways, right? And this is going back to the beginning where sometimes we take on some things that are more than we can actually handle, right? Where Musa bit off more than he can chew, right? But there's a lesson in this. That's why Allah has given us this glorious story because we are the same way. And there's no fault on Musa, but this story is really for us, right? Musa is in the upper echelon of all things, right? So this is something uh, extremely actually small, but Allah wants us to learn something from this because this happens to you and I day to day. So the teacher, he upholds the contract. Musa, this is what you said, okay? You said that you wouldn't go against anything that I said. I let you go by one time. Then there was a second time. Now the third time I'm on you. This is it between you and I. But before we depart from one another, I am now going to explain those things to you about which you had no patience, young man or young woman or anybody who takes on these characteristic traits. So Allah continues in his glorious Quran and he says, Allah uh, Allah says, Allah says, so, young man, I'm going to explain to you about the boat. The reason why I broke it is because I just wanted to make it temporarily unserviceable. You claimed and you looked at me as if I was really trying to damage the boat just out of bad will, but that wasn't the case. You didn't know that behind these poor people who did everything that they can with working and to provide for themselves and their families, there was a king, a tyrant king who was behind them, who was taking every single boat by force. But when he seen this boat and that it was unserviceable, he had he didn't want anything to do with it. Right. So imagine how the youth will feel at that time. Right. Look at that explanation. What we call it is being molded like you got molded in the sense that you thought you knew something. Psych thought you knew. Right. You thought you knew something and you assume a certain thing and especially of our teachers. Right. And so this is why Allah and even in our traditions that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encourages us to make what? How many excuses for our brothers and sisters? It was said in a narration of a hadith to make 72 excuses for your brother, right? Now, even though rightfully so, this is a prophet of Allah. And when wrong is wrong, it's the sunnah of the prophets, peace be upon them all, to speak against that which is wrong, correct? So just to make sure that we understand, right? Let's make sure we put this into perspective. Allah is a knower of all things. Just like how Allah knew when he created Adam, right? Sometimes we may think that, why did Adam ever eat from the tree, for example? Why did we have to come here and deal with this test on this earth? The same thing for Musa, alayhi salam. Allah already knows what's going to happen. And Allah made it that way so that people like you and I can learn and benefit from these things, right? And so, nonetheless, Musa, being a prophet, they have to. Prophets have to, when, everything, when anything is done wrong, they have to say something about that thing. Because if they don't, and they allow that thing to happen or occur, that means that it is permissible to do. Right? So, Musa was actually doing his job. 
So we got to make that distinction between you and I, right? It ain't like our boss said, go ahead and take a 15 minute break. And then we upheld that, yet we still got in some type of trouble or whatever. Musa was still adhering to the law of his Lord, right? He was forbidding the wrong. That's why he explained, even though he told his teacher, I wouldn't go against your command. And he still did. Why? Because in his eye, the teacher was going against Islam in a sense, even though he wasn't because the teacher was following a command of Allah as well. Right. So to continue the story. Yes. Good. But let, let us say it. OK, inshallah. And then we'll have you explain it with us, inshallah. So continuing, Allah Azza wa Jal says, and his teacher continues, he says, فأردنا أن يبدلهما ربهما خيرا منه خيرا منه زكاة وأقرب رحمة. And now Al Khidr he explains about the young boy who he seemingly murdered, and he explains to Musa عليه السلام that as for the young boy that you saw me kill. He had a disposition that Allah had created him a certain type of way. And his disposition, well, firstly, his parents were Muslims. And they were astute Muslims who truly believed in Allah. And they had so much love for this young boy. But Allah knew that the love inside of their hearts for this young boy, he would eventually grow up to be a tyrannical type of person. So Allah made it so and he commanded, just like how young people's lives are taken, in any type of way, as we can see today, right? In the Gaza, in Philistine, in the West Bank, and so on, in many places in Sudan, the lives of young people are always taken. And it's Allah's will first and foremost. And we don't mean and make it okay. And we're not saying in the sense that it's okay for oppressors to take the life of someone. But what we do want to learn from this story is that the young people's lives are taken. Ultimately by Allah. And so as Al-Khidr is, explain, is explaining this story, he tells Musa the reason why I took his life is because he had a disposition that would eventually lead his parents astray. And so your Lord wanted to replace this child of yours with an even better child and a child who was more closer to mercy. And in the tafsir, it is explained by the scholars that firstly, we know about, regarding a young boy having his life taken, he's a pure and innocent soul. So he instantly gets paradise and he's reunited back with his parents and he gets to live a wholesome, lovely life in paradise. Right. Just like all of our brothers and sisters around the world who are going through the turmoil, even though we see their blood being shed, they are martyrs and they're straight to Jannah. Right. They don't have to live and continue through this life and go through the ups and downs and the things that we go through. Allah took their life and they're immediately inside of Jannah. So they're rejoicing. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about those who are dead. And Allah mentions this to us in the glorious Quran. Don't say that they are dead. Right. These people are more alive than you and I. We just can't see the reality of what they're going through. And so they have beautiful visions of Jannah al firdaus and the, their abode that they will ultimately be staying in. And they're rejoicing with one another and they're exclaiming, Oh Allah, start Yom Qiyamah so that we can be entertained with that which you have awaiting for us. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Being a martyr is a, is a huge honor from Allah. We ask Allah for steadfastness, for steadfastness and strength. To be able to withstand anything that is sent our way. Say Amin. Alhamdulillah. And so continuing, the teacher gives his last point to Musa regarding the law. Wa <laughs> 
فأراد ربك أن يبلغ أشدهما ويستخرج كنزهما رحمة من ربك وما فعلته عن أمري So Musa's teacher explains to him and so as for the wall regarding the people who were being extremely aggressive and mean with us never mind that that wasn't the point the point is is that we are Muslims and we're not a people who retaliate based off of someone committing a certain action to us Allah gives us the right to stand up and to protect ourselves and we're not saying to not do that but We don't do this so-called eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth type of mindset or this revenge getting back. Because someone isn't hospitable to us, therefore, we do the same back to them. Allah is showing us a beautiful message. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told us, it's not the one who overstrengthens his opponent uh, through physical force, like who can wrestle him down, but it's the one who can control their anger. Allah bears witness to you and I. When we're able to hold our anger for something that we can actually let go. Like, is it really that big of a deal? Right? Is it really big of a deal if some people were inhospitable to us? Right? Yet we still choose to do something good for them because guess what it'll do? It'll change something in their hearts. Naturally, a person, when they do wrong to you and you do good to them, they don't feel bad about what they did. And their ways are going to change. So as they say, two wrongs don't make a right, right? We want to make sure we are people who have the fortitude and the resolve because we know that ultimately that the, re that the reward is with Allah Azza wa Jal. So it's a good reminder for whenever we do anything, in order for us to not feel slighted in this world, right? If a person didn't thank us, if a person didn't give back because we so quote unquote scratch their back, do it for Allah's sake. Because we know that the reward is with Allah. And there's nothing ever ending with Allah. And you'll find in yourself and in your practices that life becomes a whole lot easier when you stop waiting on creation to reward you for something. You know that it goes until your balance and your account for the akhirah. So it's important, just the way that we started off this session with saying intentions, it's super important to be very intentional about everything that you do. And know that Allah is witnessing you the whole time. And so, continuing the story, Musa, um, yes. Okay. So, the boy had not done those bad things yet. Mm -hmm. So that's one point. Mm -hmm. And the other one is this, like killing somebody because of a predisposition, mm -hmm. their inclination to do something, but yeah. not based on the act. Mm -hmm. So then there is no free will, then the boy was always predisposed to do what he was born with. Mm -hmm. So those two points we could go a little bit deeper into. Appreciate. What, okay. what is the tafsir for those? Okay, inshallah. And did, did rather than commit a murder, mm -hmm. is then would, is that okay? Is that a sin? Alhamdulillah. Yeah, okay, we'll explain. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. So, firstly, um, I will explain and we'll continue uh, the last point, inshallah. But uh, just to bring some solace and have some understanding, inshallah. So, firstly, uh, predestination is with Allah, meaning in the sense that Allah has written every single thing, right? Yet you and I, we still must uh, submit ourselves to Allah and to fulfill that which he has commanded us to do, right? So you still have choices and options to do. Yet we're talking about a young boy, right? And the purpose is Allah is showing us something, and that's why he revealed this story to us, first and foremost, right? So Allah in no way is saying that uh, murder is okay, right? Right? But nonetheless, Allah gives command to whom he wills, right? And it is for a, a reason, and Allah has the ultimate wisdom. And so I didn't, I didn't finish this point, but even though you are correct, you're correct, and on the outside it seems to be a certain way, but Allah has wisdom for every single thing. 
correct? Even the lives of our dear brothers and sisters that are being taken all around the world, correct? We will never say that certain things are okay, but it is from the predestination of Allah, and so that Allah wrote that and he willed it. And the reward is for those people who are martyred, and just like this young boy, he's a, he's a martyr, right? So he instantly gets paradise. And also on top of that, Al-Khidr was following the instruction of his Lord. And with that comes wisdom. And so this is the wisdom, uh, as we will continue inside the same verse, when, uh, when Al-Khidr is explaining about the young boy, he tells Musa that firstly, I didn't do this of my own will. وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرِي I didn't do this of my will, right? He's pointing it back to Allah Azza wa Jalla. As Allah is the one, and I was following what my Lord says. And there's plenty more of examples inside of the Quran where this happens. Like in the same chapter, uh, Allah gives to, if we heard of uh, Dhul Qarnayn, uh, the master or the possessor of the two horns, when he comes to a certain people who are very exposed to the sun, Allah tells him that you give rule to these people, right? And with those people who abide and listen, you do good to them. And those who disobey you, you have the ability to punish them how you will. And then uh, uh, Dhul also told those people, and then I will send you back to your Lord for your punishment, right? For your recompense with him. So it's just about properly putting these things in their, in their proper place. And that's why it's extremely important as well when we are reading the Quran, uh, whatever we're doing is to not take assumptions of our own self. Not saying that you're doing that, but what I'm just saying is it's important to sit with teachers uh, if you have access to the Quran. Uh, so you can ask these questions and inshallah we all be rightly guided inshallah. But in no way Allah is commanding or saying it's okay to take the lives of someone, right? This is, uh, again, Al-Khidr was following the command of his Lord, ultimately to teach Musa something. And then the wisdom inside of it is that this young boy, uh, he still gets paradise no matter what. His parents will be reunited with him. And finishing on the last point of this, uh, um, it says in a tafsir that when Allah mentioned how he wanted to replace this young boy with a child who will be better, right? So now this, the parents are substituted in their hearts are refulfilled because now they have a child. When they see that child grow up, this will be an extremely righteous child. And it is said that this child was a young girl who was given to these two parents by Allah and that this child produced a prophet, meaning she gave birth to a prophet. Right? So look at how much more khair that was actually done, even though it seems like what? But this is a life of someone, right? So Allah has ultimate wisdom. And these are some of the wisdoms that the scholars have imparted on us in order for us to settle our hearts as well. Because I had the same type of thought and inclination when I first heard it. So that's a very beautiful question. And I pray and hope that uh, that is a, f a sufficient answer and that it is clear, inshallah. Um, and just continuing and finishing up that verse, uh, the last verse, uh, Al-Khidr said to Musa to close up this story. Uh, so Al-Khidr finishes this glorious story from the way that we started in the beginning, right? His teacher instructed the young man or a young woman, young person or anyone who carries these qualities and these characteristic traits that he told him that you wouldn't have patience with me, right? He already foresaw this and he knew this is being right. Typically, even like a, as adults or anyone who's in charge of something like when we tell our kids to not do something, for example, it's because we know we have experience. We don't literally have to be able to see in the, inside the future. Right. But we know based off experience, if you keep jumping on a bed, one more monkey's going to bump their head. Right. So it's the same thing. But this is divine wisdom and mercy from a law that was given to this teacher. So imagine his obedience, like he's obeying exactly what Allah says. Uh, and so, the, again, Al-Khidr tells Musa, these are the interpretations. This is the explanation of that which you couldn't have patience with, young man. Right. And so Musa learned a huge thing from that. Firstly, before anything, and for you and I to take Allah A'lam. Allah is the one who knows best. And I should have said Allah A'lam even with that answer that I gave regarding uh, what they said in the tafsir and whatnot, right? Because Allah is the one who knows most. But these are the meanings of what it points to, alhamdulillah. So hopefully, 
that has been um, our session of the teacher and the student. But we're going to continue, inshallah, meeting. Uh, I, do we have to make salah right now? Oh, okay. I just saw that, you know, there was a two-hour window. I'm like, how can I milk that? MashaAllah. I only got so much, alhamdulillah. So, um, inshallah, we'll, we'll, I'm gonna catch it. what we love to do is just open up the floor. And if there's, if that's okay. Uh, if there's any questions, remarks, or anything that anybody would just like to share, please do so. Um, as we said in our intentions, we are here to learn and to benefit, right, and to help each other. So I'm a student along with you guys as well. Um, I only know that which I know, and I don't know what I don't. So um, I will try to answer whatever it is that I can, and please just bear patience, inshallah. Just raise your hand, inshallah, and I'll bring the mic over you. Those that are watching online, if you want to type it in the chat box, we'll uh, monitor your questions there, too. And it doesn't have to be necessarily regarding the story. We can talk. We're here. We are here as brothers and sisters. So anything it is that you want to share, whether it pertains to this talk or it doesn't, if there's an insight, if there's something inside of your heart, your mind, but ultimately your heart, if there's something that you'd like to share, please do so because we all benefit from whatever you may ask. Right? There's some questions that people. Oh, okay, alhamdulillah. Thank you, brother, very much. Uh, thank you very much. So the moral of the story over here is there are things that are happening in the world that Allah comments and does mm -hmm. that we do not know the insights about it, mm -hmm. which could be much, much better than what we actually think, right? Yes, right. So this that's a very good point, brother. Uh, thank you for saying that. That what you just said reminds me. Uh, I believe this is a hadith. Um, I don't have it memorized, but I know of hearing that. Um, no, this is in the Quran, actually. Perhaps you may dislike a thing that is good for you. Right? Allah warns us about this in the glorious Quran. Sometimes we go through certain types of ailments, or we may cling and stick to something that we just want so bad, or we just know, nah, this is your intention, and this is what you're trying to do. Right? And because I'm bothered by what it is that you're trying to do, or I know what your intention is, I'm going to try to, and I'm going to try to, Try to forbid you from doing that thing. But yet that thing possibly happening is actually better for you because you ultimately don't know. My father is in the hospital in the past three, four months. SubhanAllah. And we've been thinking, you know, his leukemia. May Allah grant him shifa. My I sister's mean, going to the same type of thing. We take it positively. I mean, we, we see this like maybe it's a gift or something. Yes. At the same time, because we've been in the hospital seeing a lot of different people. We Mashallah. don't know what's behind it. Mm. We discuss every single night that mm. maybe this is an opportunity somehow to with an opportunity give that well, maybe Mashallah. it is spread someone. Alhamdulillah. But we don't know what's behind it. Yes. So our teachers have taught us that right, we believe in the qadr of Allah, khairihi wa sharrihi, meaning we believe in what Allah has commanded to happen. We believe in it's good and whatever it's bad is. And to be more of an astute Muslim, we don't associate whatever bad happens to us to Allah. We associate it to our own selves, right? That's the proper etiquette of how to be, even though Allah is the one who has created everything and everything that happens in our lives. So that's beautiful what you shared because firstly, our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, tells us about, right, even the prick of a thorn expiates the sins of a believer, right? So whatever it is, and we ask Allah to grant your family, you said your father? Yeah. Okay. Uh, may Allah grant him shifa. If that's what's best for him and that's what Allah wants and it's better for him to still be in this world, may Allah grant him that. And if it's not, may Allah, if he takes his life, may Allah make it easy on him first and foremost and that the angels, as we spoke about today in Surah Al-Nazi'at, may the angels... Of beauty come to him and relieve him and take his soul gently from his body and show him his abode that he will be staying in and that Allah will be pleased with him and forgive him of all his shortcomings. But a beautiful thing is when we're tested with afflictions like this, like sicknesses, it's a good thing for the believer. Right? On the outside, it may look bad, but as a believer, every single thing from Allah, every test and trial and tribulation is a ni'mah from Allah. Right? And Allah, whatever pain that we go through, right? The prick of a thorn. Right? The sins of that person is expiated. That's a mercy from Allah. 
So we do ask Allah to lighten the burdens on our sick. May Allah forgive our deceased. And may Allah grant them all Jannat al firdaus and do the same with us, inshallah. And lastly, even on that point, Allah mentions to us in His glorious Quran that we'll be tested with fear, right? Loss of family, loss of wealth, and so on and so forth. And so these things are actually reminders for us, right? When our family members are afflicted, even though we don't want to see this happen to them and it's hard to deal with, and Allah has given us this test, Allah has told us that these things will happen. Because ultimately we're going to be returning back to Allah and there's goodness in it. The, the Returning back to Allah is a good thing. Right? Alhamdulillah. Let us not be people. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong that we want to be with our loved ones and we feel and we hurt. Right? But returning back to Allah is the ultimate goal. And is the ultimate beauty. So we must also try to inculcate within our minds, right, the desire to actually go back to Allah. So just with some parting advice in that regard is to make dua, read Surah al Yaseen for your father. And inshallah, I would like to add and, and read a, a, a Surah al Yaseen for him as well, that Allah helps and grant him shifa. And if Allah is to sure. take his life, may Allah um, do so very gently and console the hearts of those around him. Ameen, Ya Rabbi. Alhamdulillah. All right, we're pushing against this shot, inshallah, in two minutes. So what we'll do is, uh, for those watching online, you can put your questions in the chat box. We will uh, keep the stream going during Isha prayer, inshallah. And uh, and then if it's okay with you, we could just maybe 8.25, we'll reconvene. And okay, no. if we have additional questions, inshallah, we'll go from there, inshallah. But we'll have Azan right now since the uh, girls and boys are coming from their halakas. Sister, uh, okay, Rick. Inshallah, wow. So, okay, so I should turn this off real quick? Yeah, that'd be All great, right. yeah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Bismillahi Rahman Rahim, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, yes, the question was, can we give any type of advice um, regarding uh, raising the youth? MashaAllah. Firstly, I will speak, inshallah, with the words of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So to the ears of the young people and anybody who have these things, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us in an authentic hadith, أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ الصَّلَاةُ لِوَقْتِهَا لِوَقْتِهَا ثُمَّ بِرُّ الْوَالِدَيْنِ ثُمَّ جِهَادُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ so Allah has told us that, uh, I'm sorry, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu has conveyed to us that the most beloved things to Allah are three. And those things are uh, praying the salah first and foremost within its time. So firstly, the advice would go to the parents and the young people who are also listening is to have a connection with Allah Azza wa Jal first and foremost. For Allah is the one who gives guidance ultimately just as he's guided you. As your parents tried to guide you, Allah ultimately guided you even through them, right? And so naturally as parents, we're going to have concern for our children and we want them to do the best. But we know we have to know that it's ultimately inside of Allah's hands through us and the means that we take with that. So it's extremely important to have a connection with the salah first and foremost. And that's starting off with praying it on time is because that's what Allah loves. And within that and trying to be earnest and diligent within praying on time and not pushing the prayer to where it's like makru time. So it's, in, it's extremely important to know our fardu ayn, right, which is our obligatory knowledge as parents. So the more knowledgeable that we become uh, within these uh, things specific, uh, especially when it comes to prayer and that connection, Allah is readily available and ready to help you and I in the matters of our children. And then, secondly, following this, out of all things that Allah Azza wa Jal loves, the Most High, He says, then the Prophet Muhammad sallam, says, then it's uh, being obedient and righteous and caring to your parents. So that's a message to the parents and also to the youth, right? One of the greatest things that we can do, as we just heard inside of this hadith, is to have what is called like this uh, ihtiram or this respect and this valiancy for our parents and serving them. 
rightfully so, right? And not going against any command that goes against the Quran, obviously, but whatever it is that we are able to do within for our parents within the Sharia ah of Allah. And to make it simple, what do we mean by the Sharia? Ah? For that which is permissible and what Allah has uh, encouraged us from his glorious Quran and from what our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has told us in, in his hadith. So it's extremely important to know what it is that the Prophet did and how he lived his life. Right. And these are the ways that we can truly connect and, and be uh, an example for our children, inshallah, and especially the teenagers. Inshallah, after finishing up this uh, hadith, then I will try to give some insight of um, what I have kind of gone through being of the youth as well. And inshallah, it'll be of some benefit. And lastly, Allah says, um, I'm sorry, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, uh, striving in the cause of Allah, right? And so what we're trying to do is set the premise first and foremost of how to get our du'as answered. For we always go to Allah when we're in some trouble or we see our kids in some type of trouble and we want the best for them and we want Allah to answer our prayers. But we need to make sure that all of our checks and balances with Allah first and foremost are checked off before we assume that these prayers of ours will become answered. And so why wouldn't Allah answer his uh, beloved creation? And you will become to, uh, beloved of Allah within instilling these three virtues again which is uh, praying the salah within its right time, uh, being grateful and dutiful to your parents as best as you can, being respectful to them, speaking to them with kind words, for they brought you in this, in this world. So that's to the parents who are parents and who have children. I'm sorry, who uh, are parents and who have parents. Um, and then thirdly is striving in the way of Allah, right? So just like the story that we even took tonight, it's implementing the teachings that you know, literally, right? So if you have any problem with something like, let's say if the desires are creeping up and you have a weakness toward a desire that Allah has forbidden, that's putting a barrier between you and that said desire, right? And this is jihadu fi sabilillah. Typically, there are people who try to um, take this and put it in a bad light of what that means, right? But it's striving and struggling against yourself in order to achieve success, in order to overcome the nufus, in order to overcome the lower desires. And when Allah sees that his servant is trying to do whatever it is that they can, no matter what their weaknesses are, even when you slip up, you make tawbah, you come back to Allah, for he is the oft forgiving, the most merciful, and is waiting for your tawbah, for, your, for you to come back to him. So come back to Allah and rectify yourselves before him and put blockades and barriers between yourselves and that which brings you harm ultimately. And so this would be some advice for those parents and also for the youth uh, who are trying to deal uh, with the youth. Now, one may question, well, brother, okay, like give us something that is uh, like, you know, doable that we can do right now. And first and foremost, I, I did, right? The words of Allah and his messenger are the best of words. Now, because I've grew up in this society, I'm from Oakland, California. And so I get what it's like to be a teenager. I'm 15 years away or older than a 15 year old. So I'm kind of close to it in a sense. So I know what it's like. I went to public schools and whatnot, um, and have been amongst the urban community, right? So I get like how it is for the youth and what the youth goes through. And I also am a little bit close enough to the parents who see their children and they want to have a grasp on them. So the best advice that I can honestly give, and I know it may sound cliche, but my dear brothers and sisters, it's so important to learn the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to replace the household, first and foremost, it starts in the household, right? The way that we change individuals, firstly, is how we change ourselves. So that's knowing how to be. And we need to be like the greatest of human beings. That is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the only way to be like him is to know him and to know what it is that he did. And so with changing ourselves, we therefore 
have to work on our households. And so that's why the question was asked, how is it that we deal with these young people? But it's through your actions and characteristics, first and foremost, and implementing those inside of the household. And inshallah, that recipe will therefore follow. Um, one thing that I can say what ended up happening for me, and I've noticed uh, a lot of change inside of my household, um, I was blessed to be able to go off and study. So that's one thing, is giving your children to Islam. Literally, right? Typically, we want to. We live in the West, and we got to make money. And California is expensive, but Allah has provided means through this deen in order to be taken care of. So when we prioritize ourselves about this deen, right? About education, about implementation of that, nothing but khair, but goodness is going to come to you. So that's trying to sit in the household. You know, maybe if you have two or three hours of watching TV or something with the family, and that's a family. Um, type of commodity or action that we do here in the West, maybe uh, do two hours of watching TV and then say, okay, family, let's sit together and read a page of the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Or let's read one page of the Quran. So it starting with something extremely small and being a family, right? Putting away the cell phones, putting down the cell phones and actually connecting and being with one another. So there's many angles that we can hit this from, but it's really in order to connect, we got to drop the cell phones. We have to drop the distractions for a point in time, right? And actually sit with each other and connect with one another inside of our households so we can start talking with each other instead of at each other, right? And the one thing that my mom, she's taught me, she says, you got to do things on purpose. So you have to purposefully know like, okay, this is our time, whether it be after dinner or something like that, whenever you guys... Have it inside of your schedules to point out a fixed time for a short time. It can even be five minutes that you give. And Allah will increase you. You will see what those gatherings. For Allah says, whoever holds a gathering, specifically in the household, right? Allah will hold a better gathering with better company and will say better things about you. If it's regarding Allah, Azza wa Jal. So it's important to gather. Uh, so I know that was kind of a long-winded question, but that would be... Uh, inshallah the answer and I pray that those online and those here may benefit from that inshallah Was there any more questions? Do you know? Are you the question man? Okay, mashallah. Um, I don't I don't I think uh, our brother Oh, oh mashallah Mabruk <laughs> To those who just got married mashallah Yeah, yeah they just didn't cover that one question that did come online is, could you speak to uh, the status of Khidr? Um, like, is he a prophet? Is he a holy man? Mm. Where, why does the Quran leave him unattended on his actual status in Islam? MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, so I'll answer that which I can regarding this. Alhamdulillah, Rabbin Alameen. So Al-Khidr, um, we have, from what I know, we have received information about him regarding the companions who knew, uh, which is called the uh, Israeliyat, right? Things that have been taken from Muslims who used to be Jewish, right? And I don't remember the companion's name, but there was a certain companion who uh, was a Jew. In his conversion to Islam, he brought that which was in the people of the book's text. And they use these things to kind of try to connect some things that Allah hasn't necessarily given us. And Allah didn't need to. Allah gave us that which we just needed and we just take it as that. So answering the question regarding Al-Khidr, even I stated before um, I wasn't going to necessarily give him that name. Because we have to be uh, careful with uh, adding things from the Israeliyat. And what we say is we don't necessarily deny what the people of the book, the information that they've given us to help us with that which we have and to support that which we have. Uh, and we also don't fully accept it in a sense that so we don't fully accept nor we fully deny. Right. We just we say Allahu A'lam. And it points to that his name is Al-Khidr from the things that Allah gives us in the Quran and what connects with the stories of the people of the book. So that's what that is. And Allah actually refers to him in the in the glorious Quran as um, uh, as his servant, as his ibad, right? As a, as an abd, as a servant. Just like how, right? 
uh, as we say nashadu uh, anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu right so we acknowledge and we say that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the abd meaning the for a better translation the servant of allah slave correct but also we know as Rasul, and this is what Allah has called the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, inside the Qur'an. So this gives reason for others to also believe that he may have been a Prophet salam. So out of this respect, we are taught to send peace upon Al-Khidr uh, because a lot of things point to him being a Prophet in the views of some of the scholars. But we can't say wholeheartedly because Allah didn't say that in his Qur'an. Nor what I know of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not say that in his uh, traditions, in any of his ahadith. So alhamdulillah, that will be the answer to that question. Um, is there anything else? I, I, I think our brother Munir is going back and forth. Is anyone in the crowd have anything? Alhamdulillah. Yes, this is true. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, do we know, uh, like... When that happened relative to uh, when Moses left, um, you know, Pharaoh, um, do we have any idea about that? Okay, so let me just make sure I heard the question. Do we have any idea of when uh, this happened regarding Musa's story? Like uh, what time frame was this in relation to him going to Pharaoh, correct? And uh, mashallah, that's a really good question. Um I will have to do a further look inside of the tafsir, inside of the explanations that the scholars have given. All I know is I read from a t uh, two scholars, but one in particular from a source called Jalalain. And from my readings, what I found was that they explained that this was a young Moses. And from the story of what I know and I understand, I was... I think this, uh, what we're speaking about, happened before Musa's going to um, uh, Pharaoh and expressing to him to let his people go. So I think this was after the time when, Mo when Musa, early into his ministry, basically, before these were like the trials and tribulations he went through before actually confronting Pharaoh. Alhamdulillah. So... Um, inshallah, I hope that I will be able to find an answer on that that is much more sufficient. But to my knowledge, that's just about what I know because what was also explained and what I gathered from what the scholars have said regarding the surah. So I believe it was before uh, Musa's time of actually uh, commanding anything to Firam. Pharaoh. Alhamdulillah. Yes, but uh, just one second. Is there any more sisters that want to say anything? Or all the brothers over there? We have a brother. Yeah. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um. So there seems to be like, uh, like quite the determination where like Al Khadir, like he knows like what what he needs to do, and um, Musa alayhi salam, he also knows like uh, that he needs to be in that situation, right? And he needs to go on this tour. Mm -hmm. um, is there any wisdom that we can draw for us to realize that how we can be more determined about like um, the next actions that we need to carry out? Like, um, like I guess more elaboration on like uh, the cause of love like the causes of Allah, you said? The causes of Allah. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, you know, whether it's like for dunya, like, or like the hereafter, like, how do we become more determined about, like, the path that we need to go towards? The pact that the we path, need to The path that we need to go to. I'm sorry, towards. just one more. I, you said the pact? That yeah. We, okay. Yeah. So all right, let me just uh, condense the question just to make sure I understand it first, okay? So you're saying, are you saying, how is it that we can essentially uh, follow through with what uh, has happened? Because you, you did mention being determined, right? So when you say being determined, are you saying in a sense of if something happens, then you're therefore determined 
for the reason of why that thing happened? Or are you saying to like have determination in the sense of motivation to go and fulfill God's command? Uh, could you clarify that for me? Yeah. Um, actually, I was having a trouble articulating the question myself. But oh, no. um, it's what I noticed that with Al Kavir, like he knew uh, what his uh, task was, like right. what he needs to do, and he did it with like full determination. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, yes, you know, like yes, um, and then the observer who is Musa Islam. Okay, he was like, you know, I don't know, but you you seem to know. Mm-hmm. Okay, right? all right. So yes. how can we like? Uh, take lessons and apply that in, in our life. Okay, in our life, the choices that we make. Great. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for that. So we can refer back to the story. First and foremost, Al Khidr, the teacher of uh, Musa, this servant, right? He literally was commanded by Allah. Correct. So he's doing exactly what his Lord said. And however Allah commanded that to to him, meaning giving him that revelation to go ahead and carry this out with this young man who will come to you, is what he did and what he fulfilled. So first and foremost, what we can do is what we kind of mentioned before, is knowing what it is that Allah wants from us, right? So Allah tells us to establish the salah, right? Allah tells us, like gives us the command, literally, to go pray in congregation. Allah commands us to fast. Allah commands us to give zakat, right? Allah commands us to go on hajj if we have the means to be able to do so, correct? Allah commands us to take our shahada, essentially, if we have that full belief and conviction in the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and we believe in what Allah has revealed. So firstly is knowing, right? That's the difference of the creation of the human being. The human being was given intellect to be able to know what it is that um, that they are commanded to do. And naturally, the human being wants to worship, right? So when you know what the source has commanded you to do, you have much more of an easier life to be lived and fulfilling that uh, requirement of you because you know what it is that you're supposed to do. So it's kind of hard to have determination inside of something if you don't even know what you're determined to do, right? And so when you take those Uh, commands and you apply it to anything it is that you do in life, you will live much more of a uh, controlled and fulfilled type of lifestyle because you know that you are ultimately submitting yourself to Allah and what he has said for you to do. So for uh, example, another time in the Quran, Allah mentions like specifically after the khutbah is given to go out into the land and to uh, find your success, right? To go uh, and do your business dealings and whatnot afterwards. So you know based off of what Allah has commanded you. So it's ultimately important to, first and foremost, sit in gatherings of remembrance so that you may come to know. Secondly, is attaching yourself to, well, firstly, is attaching yourself to the glorious Quran, right? And as we mentioned as well, is attaching yourself to loving the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the way that you become to loving someone is by getting to know them. So these will help and aid us in our determination and whatever it is that we do. Right. So anytime that you see somebody doing anything and you may see wow, they're very determined, it's because they believe in the applications and the rules of applying themselves to that thing. Therefore, they know they will find success. Right. Why does a basketball player do what they do? Why do they go and train as much as they do? Why does someone who wants to win a Nobel Prize and receive recognition Right. Even though we should be seeking ref- recognition from Allah solely and we want to benefit benefit creation for Allah solely. But why do people do what it is that they do? Why do they become astute in what it is that they study? It's because they have that determination because they know what they're supposed to do. Right. So hopefully that inshallah will uh, add some benefit and hopefully clear it up. May Allah grant us all determination to be the best servants of him that we can possibly be and be true followers of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I mean. I have a question if you don't mind. Yes. So regarding when you mentioned the Israelites but mm-hmm. also synonyms they refer to them as the Jews, right? We uh-huh. believe that as Prophet subhanahu wa ta'ala said you are born Muslims and then you're put into a different situation. Now we mm-hmm. also know that the whole thing that you're born as Jew is contradictory even to Islam itself and to real life because you cannot be born to a religion. It's a tribal thing. Mm-hmm. So weren't there also Israelites who were Muslims technically 
not making them Jews, or is it like most of them were Jews and we just put them as such? Is that okay? So, are you talking about like during the time of the Prophet Muhammad and Allah said them, like uh, people born being born into a different religion other than Islam? No, no, I'm talking about the the, the people who were descent of uh, Israel of Yaqub or Israel So, okay, uh -huh. yeah, yeah Al Kitab they referred to them as the Jews, but we know that you know Israelites were some were Muslim. So some were Jews, some were Christian, but uh, most people refer to them as black. Oh, okay, I get what you're saying. Okay, yeah. so there is an important distinction to be able uh, that has to be made, right? So when a group of people, specifically when Allah sent any messenger, they were all Muslim, right? right. So we have to be able to take this root of Muslim, the scene, the lamb, and the meme, and understand what does that mean first and foremost. Of course. So when you understand what Islam is, this, this is essentially submission, right? Just in a nutshell. And so any prophet, peace be upon them all, who was sent by Allah is rightfully so a Muslim because... They submitted themselves to Allah and they fulfilled the will of Allah and not their own, yes. right? And so what has happened in history and from what I know and understand, these other names, right? For example, like Ibrahim, alayhi salam, like Allah mentions in the Quran that he was Hanifan Musliman, right? He was an upright, straightforward Muslim, right? right? And so these different names comes from people who follow these people or... Uh, yes, yeah, so who follow in the sense that they weren't with that prophet at that particular point in time, but later because of traditions and what their forefathers raised them on, therefore they associate themselves with that. And these people started making these certain names for a certain way of life, right? Yes. So any, like the 12 tribes, for example, uh, of the Israelites, right? These are all Islamic or Muslim foundations it's all islam yes. right but it's just called something different because that's what those people call it but as a muslim when we have the understand when we have the understanding we know what it truly is and it at one point in time was the truth but because it wasn't preserved the way that allah has allah has preserved the glorious quran just like anything it ends up coming corruption inside of that thing Yes. And so naturally so, those people of those faiths will follow that in truth, knowing because they're clinging to those things which we differ from, right? And we know because of the way that the Qur'an has been preserved and the truth of what it is, it's Al-Furqan Al and it distinguishes uh, truthhood from falsehood, right? So yes. all of it is really the same thing. And they call this, uh, they, that's why they call it the, Abraham, uh, the Abrahamic faiths, right? Like Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Because we yeah. all have a one connection, and so I hope this answers your question. Is that is that sufficient enough, or yeah, just add a little more? Uh, mm -hmm. I know that for the Jews, for example, they they believe that uh, God told Musa alayhi that to kill the Hittites, the Canaanites, and all these people. We know mm -hmm. that the twelve tribes themselves mm -hmm. were of Canaanite origin, at least, or of of that part of the world. So, mm -hmm. to me, that seems like it's like as if Jews today, they say the land of Palestine is Jewish, but at the same time, we kill the Palestinians. So, that's, so that's that's what I'm trying to like. Okay, to correlate, alhamdulillah. So this is what I would say on my tiny bit of what I've realized of what's even going on within Philistine, yeah. right? And we ask Allah to grant our dear brothers and sisters in Palestine and all over the world his salam and his afia and to heal them and to relieve them of the burdens that they are being struck with and this is for every single person and every single person here in, yeah. in the lands of california and so on and so forth yeah. so what we will have to do is understanding truly what and who are jews first and foremost we know that being of the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no matter what anyone claims, they are of the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad and they should be, we should all be following the Prophet Muhammad and his message Sallallahu yes. Alaihi Wasallam. Yes. Now today, we live in a time where there are people who are sheep's, are, are wolves in sheep's clothing, yes. right? 
and they claim and they take on the so-called look and disguise of a certain group of people in the name of religion and commit atrocities, right? And this is like Islam hasn't uh, is is not it, um, Islam has been subject to this as well, right? People in the name of a religion go and commit things that are that is against that religion. Yes. So what I can do and speaking to that because I am no uh, student of the Bible nor of uh, you know the Old Testament or the New Testament, so I can't really say much besides is knowing who are the true believers of a certain type of faith. And there are real Jews and Orthodox Jews, just like there are real Muslims who have uh, the same tenets and principles as us, right? And they know that what's going on inside of those lands is horrendous, and they're fighting and standing up against that. But the corrupt powers that be, that Allah has allowed to do what they're doing, they are, again, wolves in sheep's clothing, and they're pretending to be someone who they're not in the name of religion because it brings them a quote-unquote benefit of what they think. But woe to the hands of those people of what they have committed and have been committing. And Allah does not like oppression. And Allah is fierce against those who practice oppression. So may Allah relieve us from being of the oppressors and from being oppressed. Amen. Amen. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I pray that was sufficient, but that's just a, about what I know from what I have surveyed and just what I know regarding religion. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Is there anything else? Anybody else would like to ask anything? Alhamdulillah. we got about five more minutes. <clears throat> Going once. Going twice. Anybody? Would anybody that could just add anything, share anything to the group, uh, anything that they may have taken from the class or any as yes, <clears throat> he is going to bring you the mic. <clears throat> Question on the uh, like the Sharia, right? Sharia, uh, uh -huh. Sharia. Mm -hmm. Um, so <clears throat> like, uh, is there like a compiled uh, book, or is it a term that describes? All the rulings that naturally come from the Quran and the Hadith. MashaAllah, that's a really great question. Allahumma salli wa sallim on that city. So, for the first part, I couldn't tell you if there is a compilation, meaning being compiled inside of a book. I'm sure it is, but not one that I know of because that's above my pay grade as a student. Like, I haven't gotten to that. But I do know that there are things as that. And yes, the scholars have extracted first and foremost from the ultimate and number one scholar, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Sharia comes from the root of the Sheen, the Ra, and the Ain. And within that, just like, uh, so you may have heard of uh, Shadr, meaning like a street, right? So it means a way. And this way, from what our teachers have taught us, means to, like, okay, for example, why do human beings live in any place that they live in? It's because there's water there, right? So the sharia is like the path to the watering hole, right? A human being wouldn't live inside of a place if there was no water because, therefore, you wouldn't survive. You wouldn't be able to produce sustenance or have anything grow, go, go forth, right? Let alone from uh, dying of thirst, but not able to feed the land to produce food for you to consume, which Allah has blessed us with. So the sharia is the watering hole, basically, that we go to to collect our sustenance because it is the best way for us to nourish ourselves, right? And so... Um, this has been compiled from the Quran first and foremost, and also the ahadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which supports uh, everything from the Quran. And there's different levels of uh, ahadith as well that um, are still from the words directly from Allah, but it's not inside of the Quran. So yes, this is what we take from in order to um, derive our guidance. And so. The Sharia is essentially you can just always point back to the Quran, but it gives it more of a breakdown for the human being to be able to digest. And so what the scholars ultimately have did, you, you will find Sharia inside of what is called like a madhab, for example, right? A certain type of school of thought. 
And the same thing what these great scholars have done is they've taken from the Quran and the Sunnah, the Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his ways, they have compiled and taken exactly what has been understood and what the Pro Prophet, peace be upon him, practiced and has made it so and condensed it into places for people like you and I to be able to go to and to learn from so we can know what it is that Allah wants from us. And it goes back actually to your question about how to be determined in whatever it is that you're doing. So when it comes to, so when we talked about uh, the obligatory knowledge, right? Like it's important to know where to go to your watering home, right? So it's like if you don't know, how will you ever be nourished if you don't know where this watering hole is? So that's why knowledge is extremely important, right? So you can know how to go to that watering hole, excavate, excavate the water from it, and to ultimately benefit from it. So that's what this sharia is. And forgive me for not uh, being able to like tell you what a book is or whatnot. But I would always suggest uh, you go to those who know more. So I'm sure there's someone in here who, um, well, I can at least point you in the direction of teachers who would know. Um, and how to get connected in a sense to start learning these things so we can start applying them to our lives, inshallah. And I hope that answers the question, inshallah. Is there anything else anybody else would like to share a question, um, join us in on? Okay. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. We will raise our hands together and just make a dua. As we close, Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min adhab al-jahannam wa min adhab al-qabr wa min adhab fitnat al- wa min adhab al-mahya wa al-mamati wa min shar fitnat al-masih al-dajjal wa min al-maghrami wa al-ma'tami. Allahumma Allahumma ghfir lana ma qaddamna wa ma akharna wa ma أصرفنا وما أسررنا وما أعلنا وما أنت أعلم به منا أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر. Oh Allah, we seek your guidance and we seek protection from the hellfire. Oh Allah, we seek your protection from the torment of the grave. Oh Allah, we seek protection from you from the ailments of this worldly life, and we seek protection protection from you, oh Allah, from the times and the trials of the dajjal and from sinning and corruption, O oh Allah. We ask you to forgive us for that which we have done outwardly and secretly, the things that we have wasted, O oh Allah. You know that which we do. You are the all-seeing. You are the all-knowing, O oh Allah. You are the first. You are the last, O oh Allah. And there is no God but you. We ask you to grant us beneficial knowledge. And we ask you to grant us a connection to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and being a devout follower of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, your beloved, O oh Allah. We ask you to relieve all of us of our pains and our ailments, spiritually, mentally, and physically, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask the same for all of our brothers and sisters around the world who are going through torment, Ya, Allah, ya Rabb, for you to raise them in their stations, O oh Allah, and ultimately to grant all of us a beautiful death. And that we ultimately return to you in the highest levels of paradise where we don't have to stand on your muqiyama waiting for reckoning, but we stand underneath your throne, the, the shade of your arsh, ya Rabbil Alameen, and ultimately you enter us into your highest jannah and that we have companionship with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So with this dua and with this intention, may Allah reward all of our teachers. May Allah benefit us all with this knowledge and may Allah make us knowledgeable fi khair wa lut wa afia in Allah's endearing graciousness. And we say this with the secret of Al-Fatiha, with the presence of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah ar-Rahim. Alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Malik ya'un al-Din. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ahlina usirat al-Mustaqt al-Musaqat al-Adina na'amdi alayhim wa khayr al-Maktubi alayhim wa ba'adin amin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's been a pleasure sitting with you all. Thank you and I've benefited from you all tremendously. I pray that you guys have, uh, are able to take something from this and that Allah grant you all hidayah and his mercy. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum